name is Joseph, and welcome to the ASMR Critique, where we will be doing critical takes of pop culture favorites and obscure media as well. I will be looking at all sorts of media and products. I will also be doing role plays and public domain audiobook reading. So I hope you will join me by subscribing to this channel. Without further ado, please enjoy. And today, I'd like to speak about one of my all-time favorite films. That's right, I'm talking about none other than Kiki's Delivery Service, the 1989 masterpiece by Hayao Miyazaki and Studio Ghibli. I apologize if there are thunderclaps in the background as it is storming outside. Kiki's Delivery Service is based on Eiko Katono's novel, which I have not read, but it was released in 1985. So Kiki's Delivery Service is a bit of a combination, coming-of-age story, a fish-out-of-water story, and a uh, treatise on burnout and depression and being different. It is, in many ways, an ode to individualism and being true to yourself. There will be spoilers as I will talk about the plot, but this film is not very plot-heavy anyway. Spoilers! Kiki comes from a family of magical practitioners, and as she has just turned 13, and as part of her coming-of-age process, she is going to spend a year in a far-off uh, town or city to kind of discover herself and her passion and what she can do to help people out. And it is tradition among the witches and wizards of this world, as magic is something that is practiced by a select few people who are healers and practice other trades, or at least that is what's hinted at in the film. The film may star a young protagonist, but the trials she undergoes are very relatable even to adults. She is trying to make the best of a difficult situation. And although it's, like, pretty far removed from your typical modern upbringing, you know, just leaving the house to explore the world, I mean, what if she ends up in some, like, really messed up place? Regardless of that, she is able to rise to meet the challenges that await her, and I think that is a really beautiful and inspiring thought. Kiki is also quite a traditionalist, which is presented in kind of a sharp contrast to the other children and teenagers around her age, but I'm getting ahead of myself. The plot of the film is, um, as I've described, fairly simple. The film starts with a kind of anticipation of action as Kiki is listening to the radio. And the DJ says that skies are going to be clear. That is her go signal. And she tells her parents very excitedly that she's ready to go. She's raring. She's been preparing for this. She is excited. She wants to make her mark on the world. And to do her best. And discover her place and her independence. Usually when a film starts out with the protagonist being like super pepped up and excited. That's when you know the movie's gonna throw them some harsh realities. Truth bombs. Red pills. Black pills. The whole gamut of difficulties. Nah, but Kiki's journey starts off innocently enough. She and her talking cat, Gigi, only she can hear, start off the journey by a beautiful evening flight. Pretty soon, they are joined by another witch, who is 
is a little on the stuck up side. She, similarly to Kiki, is very assured of herself. But at the same time, you can kind of see a little bit through her facade that she herself doesn't really know what she's doing. She's just pretending like she knows, which kind of sets her apart from Kiki, who is very honest about the fact that she doesn't really know what she's doing. That encounter shows kind of a contrast between Kiki and the other witch. It shows that there is almost a social hierarchy even amongst the witches of the time, and she also might be a little more influenced by the quote-unquote modernized world. Anyway, they don't chat for very long, and Kiki decides to go off to another town. Kiki does spend the night in a train and is woken up by a bunch of cows, and then she flies off to what looks quite a bit like Fisby, a island down in Sweden, and a lot of the shots in Kiki's delivery service are based off of film that they took of the town, and it definitely has that look and feel of early to mid 20th century. sister-in-law made it. It is of Princess Peach. And, uh, she did a custom wood burn for me. She's really good at this sort of stuff. Isn't it beautiful? Hope you're doing well. If you're watching this. wonder if I can get some good textural sounds out of this. So from afar, circling the city, Kiki already decides that it's the perfect place because it's so, so, so beautiful. But then she flies in to take a closer look and trouble traffic. Yeah. Kiki almost causes a major traffic incident while flying into the town. And that is definitely a foreshadowing of what is to come. Already, the theme of traditionalism versus modernity is starting to manifest itself. It's one of the things I really love about Hayao Miyazaki's films, is how all of them sort of effortlessly This can also be said of Isao Takahata, who was his mentor and co-founder of Studio Ghibli. His films are just as good, in my opinion, if not better. So after the incident, Kiki attempts to introduce herself to a random crowd on the street corner, and some older lady just says, oh, that's lovely, dear, and they all kind of just walk away, and Kiki is left kind of speechless and dumbfounded. What's worse, a police officer even shows up to kind of confront her about the incident, um, and then he asks her, 
asks her where she lives. It's such a rude awakening to like modern city life. Such a far cry from what she's used to. It's a very, very uh, clear statement. And then walking down the street, I believe she does meet Tombo, who is there with his group of friends. You know, a bunch of young people all riding in a car, crammed in an automobile. Fashionable. And they poke fun at Kiki. But Tombo, Tombo doesn't care about that stuff. He thinks Kiki's amazing because she can fly. As an aspiring aviator himself, Tombo is in love with the idea of flight. In some ways, Tombo is almost swept up by the futurist fervor that is reflective of what was happening in real life in 20th century Europe. This is the Time Turner from the Harry Potter series. Let's see what kind of sounds we can get from it. That is 
is the power of the media. Our media can be helpful or harmful. I think in most cases it's quite harmful, but I digress. So Kiki eventually ends up at Osomo's place. Osomo is a pregnant woman who runs a bakery with her husband. Due to her physical state, she could use a little help, and she does have an extra room, which she very graciously offers to Kiki. rushes off on a broom to give someone a package that they left behind at the bakery, and she gets the idea of opening a delivery service. And of course, like any small business, when she first starts out, she is beset by various challenges. Cat she said to deliver gets misplaced. And part of the reason why it happened was she was just trying a little too hard, you know. Kiki's attitude is that she will go above and beyond to get the job done, which is kind of a blessing and a curse. She gets lost when she flies head on into a gale. She gets thrown from her broom. There is such a thing as trying taking proper care of yourself, and that's what Kiki does. She has something to prove. She feels a need to succeed, which is not a bad thing. It's basic self-preservation, but she goes too far. She doesn't practice self-care. She doesn't love what she's doing. She feels overextended. Later on in the film, the roadblocks Kiki hits become more and more personal, and 
challenging until she gets sick trying to deliver a present. She helps an old woman to bake a beautiful dish for her granddaughter's birthday. And the granddaughter, when she opens the door, is much more concerned with her group of friends and does not even seem grateful for the present. And it's not hard to see why the sort of psychic shock of that happening ends up being a point of depression for Kiki. And so there's this period of the film where she is in a psychic funk. She's wrestling with her own demons and completely unable to use magic. pushes Tombo away. This is some just false gold I got. I got in Mariposa, California by the Merced River. Some friends and I, we were looking for gold, sifting. I just keep it to commemorate the afternoon because it was so lovely. The only thing that can really snap Kiki out of her funk is, of course, the double whammy of a true friend and a change in scenery. Kiki's friend Ursula invites her to stay with her at her cabin in the woods, the pastoral setting combined with a really good pep talk, which is my favorite scene in the movie, I think really does wonders to help put everything in perspective for Kiki. Kiki is manifesting all of the signs of depression. She doesn't gain enjoyment from the things that she used to, including her radio. She can't practice her magic, which springs from like a well inside her. And she can't even speak to Gigi, which thematically, in my opinion, means that she is lacking in her connection to the natural world. She has entered such an unnatural environment in this modernized, busy, bustling city that she no longer knows what's up and what's down. Another theme the film seems to be exploring is the theme of individuals who sort of go against the grain or prefer to march to the beat of their own drum, so to speak. And of course, I'm talking about Kiki, Tombo, and Ursula. These are the two people that I think Kiki shows the most connection with in the film. And each of them is an individualist who follows their own passions. In Tombo's case, he is interested in one thing and one thing only, and that is flight. He wants to be up there soaring in the clouds with the birds. Tombo shows some echoes of Jiro Horikoshi, who was the protagonist of Miyazaki's magnum opus, uh, The Wind Rises. He is in love with machines. He believes in the power of machines and the future, which we'll get to that in the climax. But going back to this theme, Tombo is pretty much instantly attracted to Kiki because of her individualism and her unique nature. But back to the theme of lonely individuals in a society seeking one another out. None of these three really fits in. Ursula especially has grown so tired of civilization that she lives alone in the forest. Now, that can't be easy, living alone in the forest, but once you've lived enough in the city, you can imagine how one might crave the isolation. But for someone who has lived in the countryside, I can safely say that living in the city really doesn't compare to living in the country. Just the air quality, the lack of noise, and being surrounded 
by trees and animals, or just by whatever is around, whatever naturally grows there, whether it is a desert or a tundra or a plain, it's the natural world. Living in and around nature can't be beat. So Ursula is one of those people, and in her own way, she is kind of a witch too. She practices art, which in and of itself is a kind of magic, and in the conversation that she has with Kiki, she shares some of her own wisdom and compares Kiki's situation to her own artistic burnout. And I think that everyone can relate to this idea of burnout, whether you consider yourself an artist or not. It is super common in this modern world to just feel trapped, 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 like there is no room for you as an individual to shine through or to exist. That is a very common and valid feeling for someone living in these highly strange times in human history. is a very crucial moment for her character. Ursula is very perceptive of Kiki's plight. She can tell, just from Kiki saying she's taking some time off, that she's going through something. I think that spending time with Ursula is really a panacea to Kiki, and she really inspires her to pick herself up off the ground. Everyone who's down needs a friend like Ursula, somebody to tell them that they're beautiful, and to give them a little pep talk, to get them back on their feet and going again. Because Lord knows life is tough. The cure that Ursula prescribes to Kiki is the cure I would prescribe to anyone going through some sort of artist's block or writer's block, and that's to take a break, to take a step back, take a walk, take a nap, be in nature, be around people you love, zone out, meditate, don't worry, be happy, trust that God or the universe or the Tao. Ursula really inspires Kiki. Sometimes all you need is to take a break, because when you're struggling with something, it can become an obsession. It can feel like nothing is ever going to improve or get better. It can feel like you are stuck running in place. It can feel like you are Sisyphus, eternally fated to push a boulder up a hill. But you know what? None of 
us have to be Sisyphus because our lives, they don't last forever. It's like Gandalf tells Frodo in the Fellowship of the Ring film. So do all who live to see such times, but that is not for them to decide. All we have to decide is what to do with the time that is given to us. Because nothing lasts forever. It's funny because Ursula talks about needing to find her own style and how she couldn't quite get her painting right and even thought about destroying it. But then when she saw Kiki sad that day, that kind of gave her the missing piece of the puzzle, the sadness. And that kind of harkens back to the theme of depression, and how it can be an inspiring force in life. There is something to that old saying, that whatever doesn't kill you, makes you stronger. I'm also reminded of a comment that Tom York of Radiohead made once, where he said he doesn't like that people disparage Radiohead's music by calling it depressing because he thinks that invalidates the sort of creative power that depression can have. Ursula's statement to Kiki also reminds me a little bit of chapter two of The Picture of Dorian Gray, where Lord Henry makes an observation to Dorian that he will never be as young or beautiful as he was in the picture, and that haunts Dorian. It terrifies him. After that, the picture is cursed for Dorian, and he laments that he would give his soul if it were only the other way around, and thus he gives up his soul. That's kind of the flip side of this story of someone hoping to become eternally young or to retain their eternal youth. Whereas someone like Kiki wants to grow up. Kind of interesting, isn't it? I would say that there is kind of a obsession with the youth in modern storytelling. Why is it that every anime seems to have young protagonists, like teenagers, like 13 or 14 year olds who have just like suffered ridiculous amounts of trauma. It's kind of funny how so many media these days almost seem to glorify youth. Hollywood has kind of a obsession with teenage martyrs, wouldn't you say? Young teenagers who, for some reason, despite their brains not being fully developed, are tasked with saving the world. Man, I know, I know saving the world was not the first thing on my when I was 13 years old. But see, that's the other beautiful thing about Kiki's delivery service. It's almost a slice of life film, except it's not. But yeah, Kiki doesn't really fit in with the kids of her own generation. This film kind of feels like an ode to those misfits, almost. 
calls to stand out those individual minds and hearts who don't quite fit in with the crowd. Another one of the individualists that Kiki gets along with is the older grandmother character, whom she helps to bake a dish for her granddaughter's birthday. Later on in the film, her kindness is repaid when the older woman invites Kiki to her house. Towards the end of the film, that scene is like so sweet. It's just, it just pulls at your heartstrings, you know? Every time I see such a deep connection between the younger and the older generation, it kind of gives me hope for this world. I think that Mr. Miyazaki really knows how to like pull at your heartstrings in that way and to get you feeling really happy and uplifted. Of course, the proper thing for a filmmaker to do is to introduce a climactic scene full of tension immediately following this emotional catharsis. And so there's the scene with the dirigible, and Kiki needs to summon up all of her inner strength and let the magic sort of course through her and guide her. She grabs the street sweeper's broom, and at first it doesn't quite do the trick. She has to kind of let go of all of her fears and anxieties. Just let it go and let the universe work its magic. And then of course she flies off to save Tombo, which is truly a lovely scene. One of the odd idiosyncrasies between the original Japanese version and the English Disney dub is the fact that Gigi talks again at the end of the film. In the Japanese version, Gigi does not talk. He just remains a cat at the end of the film. When I was younger, I preferred that he spoke again in the dub. Like Kiki was able to hear him and understand him again. But now I'm kind of swinging the other way. And I feel like Kiki not being able to understand Gigi anymore shows a sort of setting of things on their proper course. Kiki is becoming a woman and Gigi is becoming more of a cat. Less of a familiar. He is able to become more actualized as a cat by settling down and having a family. And Kiki is able to become more independent by not relying on Gigi and others so much. So yeah, Kiki's Delivery Service is a film that works on every front for me. It works as a journey of self-discovery, a coming-of-age story, a fish-out-of-water story, a sort of thematic commentary on the changing and evolving nature of human society, the differences in city and country life, and this dichotomy between traditionalism and modernity on personal and social slash societal levels, and it serves as a showcase for these characters who are trying to navigate this environment by seeking out like-minded souls. I would say probably the only criticism I have about the film is how it is so squarely focused on just Kiki's character. I felt that they could have explored the world a little more, made it a little bit more of an epic, but that is not really a fault of the films. It is the focus of the film. Therefore, it's not truly a fault. I would also say that I prefer the subtitled version over the English dub. No offense to Kirsten Dunst, who I love as an actress, but her work as Kiki falls into kind of the lower echelon of Disney Ghibli dubs, in my opinion. So, if you don't mind the subtitles, I would highly recommend the Japanese version of Kiki's Delivery Service. Oh, and the score is absolutely fantastic. I know it goes without saying, but Joe Hisaishi, the 
legendary composer does excellent, excellent work uh, on this film. And his music is very, very, very relaxing. Would I recommend Kiki's Delivery Service? Nah. I'm just joshing you. Of course I would recommend this movie. Nah. It is my go-to panacea for any time. I am feeling down in the dumps. I will just play this movie in the background. I guarantee you it will lift your spirits. I would give Kiki's Delivery Service a 9.5 out of 10. Thank you so much for tuning in. And if you like this content, please leave a like, comment, and subscribe if you have not already done so, so that I can grow this channel.